few lived back in medieval times, and he needed a loan for a home mortgage. Could you get one from your local bank or a savings and loan? Could you open a checking or savings account at a medieval bank? And if so, what level of interest did they pay you? Did they have credit cards, say, peasant card, don't leave home without it, or traveler's checks, such as Holy Roman Empire checks? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I'm Professor Jerome Arkenberg, and I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about the role of the Templars in banking, the role played by the church in church bans and usury, the role of Jewish bankers and moneylenders, and medieval problems with fiscal management. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video. But first, make sure to click like, share, and subscribe, and that little bell thingy, so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. After the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West, both gold and silver coin nearly disappeared. But as the economy grew after the 10th century, as part of the commercial revolution, and you can learn more about that in my video on the High Middle Ages, a variety of silver coins, collectively known as Groschen, Grotournois, or Groats, appeared, followed by gold coins in the 12th century, with the Florentine Florin, that's this one here, the Florentine Florin, the Ducat, of Venice and the Flemish Gulden coming to function as Europe's currency. These, of course, are various groats, Bavarian, English, and Polish. Medieval rulers and princes of all types, knowing little of fiscal management, though, often yielded to temptation to gain temporary financial relief by debasing the currency causing inflation or even currency collapse. Now, by debasing, in other words, you can't make your coin 100% out of silver or gold because it's just too pliable, but it's pretty close. So how do you maybe make a bit of money off your coinage? Well, instead of, say, putting 95% of gold on every coin, put 90% or 75% or 50%. So the coin is mostly gold, half gold and half crapoleum. But of course, everybody who does business, there's no such thing as paper money or anything, does business, they want actual gold or actual silver. So in other words, if it's 50% gold, where it had been 95% gold beforehand, suddenly it's worth half as much. And as a result, inflation begins to take off. Now, inflation was never really huge. There was nothing like 20, 30, 40, 100% in the Middle Ages. It was mostly 0 to 1%. But if it goes up to 5%, that was disastrous for medieval times. However, even the most fiscally responsible governments were limited by the scarcity of precious metal as little gold was produced in Europe, what gold had been there beforehand was pretty much exhausted by the end of the Roman Empire, and silver was only produced, and only after it was discovered in the uh, High Middle Ages, in Saxony, Hungary, Bohemia, and Austria. Most of the gold was essentially being imported. 
as European states were able to sell their wares to the Muslim states for gold. Now, banking had disappeared with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, which you can learn more about in my video on the fall of the Roman Empire. But with the establishment of the Kingdom of Jerusalem after the First Crusade, which is covered in the lecture, the video on the feudal age, the necessity of transferring large sums of coin to finance it led to the reemergence of banking led by the Templars. Crusaders and others journeying to the Holy Land, and here's a Templar demand note, could deposit coin with the Templars, who had priories established across Europe, and in return for which they would be given a demand note, redeemable for cash, the amount of cash that you had deposited, at any priory or in their priories at the Holy Land, allowing for easy movement of monies without loss. So of course, you could lose your demand, though, in which case, too bad for you. Anyway, the Templars themselves simply built a local stock of currency in each priory from their many money-making ventures. So in other words, let's say you're in England in you're not even sure you're going to go to the Holy Land. In theory, you are. So you put in, say, a thousand gold pieces at the temple in London. They give you this demand note. And that lasts you know, for a while. You've got, say, 50 to 100 florins with you. And by the time you get to Rome, you've pretty much exhausted that. And you want another 500. So what do you do? You go to the Priory in Rome present your demand note, ask for 500 of the 1,000 that you had put in, and they give you then the 500 and give you a new demand note. The demand note now being saying that you only have 500 on account. And again, this way you could travel anywhere in Europe. Essentially, each of these demand notes function as a traveler's check. Money changers at trade fairs soon took deposits for notes payable at other fairs or future fairs, essentially the same type of thing, thus turning themselves into bankers. And these notes would evolve into a bill of exchange redeemed at any office of the issuing banker, essentially along the same basis, functioning as a kind of traveler's check. However, church law. The Catholic Church, relying on Scripture, and this is found in Deuteronomy 23, verses 10 to 20, Exodus 22, verse 25, Leviticus 25, verse 33 to 37, and the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 6, verses 24 to 35, bad usury. And usury was defined as anything taken for a loan, inhibiting growth. So you would loan people money, but the idea is you would do it out of the goodness of your heart. You wouldn't expect anything back. The ban on usury, though, was gotten around through two legal fictions. First, you can get an interest-free loan with an equivalent fee for insuring it against loss, injury, or delay in payment. In other words, you get your loan, and the person who lends you the money in return gets a fee, an insurance fee, so to speak. The insurance fee being equivalent to the interest you would have normally paid. So essentially, you are paying interest, they're just not calling it interest. The second reason is taking actual possession of the farmland, mines, or timberlands given as collateral. In other words, you go, you get your loan, and the lender, now you put up this land, today you can put it up as collateral, but you still get control of it and all the profits that come from it. But back then, the lender gets control of it. 
and all the profits that come from it are kept as his or hers, mostly his, in lieu of the interest. So the profits that is taken from it, these collateral lands, essentially is the interest on the loan. Of course, if you do default, the lender gets to keep all these lands that you put up. Of course, you can always get a loan from a Jewish banker who is not bound by church rules and usury. And they quickly began offering not just financing, but also underwriting for crops, commodities, and chips. However, in England in 1290, when King Edward I defaulted on debts due his Jewish bankers, what did he do? He simply confiscated all their assets and lands and expelled them from the kingdom and canceled his debt. They were not allowed to return until the time of Oliver Cromwell, which, of course, you can hear about in the video on the Cromwell and Commonwealth. Having invented the Bill of Exchange, double-entry bookkeeping, and interest-bearing legal fiction loans, the Italians, with their access to gold and the luxury trade with Byzantium and the Muslim lands, soon dominated banking across Europe, especially the Florentines, the Mozzi, the Bardi, Pruzzi, Accioli, and the Medici families, who soon had branches across Europe. The wrap-up quote. Let it be clear to all reading or hearing these present that we owe this money and we are bound to return it to you peacefully and without molestation up to one month after the ship in which we sail shall have arrived at Marseille or at any port of safety in Provence for discharging its cargo. And for your greater security, we have pledged to you 141 pigs, which we jointly own on that same ship. But if those pledges are worth more than the debt to you, it will be to our credit, the rest to yours. This is from the promissory note of Bartholomew Mazillier and Peter Vital, both of Marseille, from 1249. Let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video. It's short, but sweet. And what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos on the Middle Ages. And make sure to click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.